Today, we have the pleasure of having Linda Alberry. Her 25 years of broad and diverse experience in healthcare leadership have included positions as Senior Vice President for Business Development and Client Operations with a major revenue cycle provider and Chief Operating Officer with a large Midwest tertiary hospital. We are very excited to have you, Linda, and at this point, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, let me just do a sound check. You can hear me okay, right? Sure can. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm um, glad to be here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about benchmarking and the relationship between benchmarking and performance improvement and cost reduction. We've got about 45 minutes of content and some time at the end for questions. As far as our agenda, a brief introduction, and then I'm going to provide an overview of benchmarking and best practices. And then I'll get into a case study of one of our particular clients that um, has been, uh, to me, a poster child of success. And then we, again, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. As Lisa mentioned, I've been in the healthcare industry for quite a while. I've been around the block a time or two. Um, and I've been in your position if you're working in finance. Um, I was a COO for a hospital, but through my work with um, Accretive Health, I did a lot of work in finance and revenue cycle as well. Currently, I am a senior vice president with Advantage Health Analytics. And our company provides healthcare analytic tools for hospitals and healthcare systems. And our tools are designed to help organizations manage their performance. And we'll get to some of those tools a little bit later. But our conversation is more going to be around benchmarking. So what is it? Uh, it's pretty simple. It's the process of comparing performance against a relevant peer group in order to identify variances and inform performance improvement. Now, I, I want to kind of just go back and um, have you look at that definition, because many organizations will stop at the point of identifying variances and comparing to a peer group. And um, that, I would say, is pretty old school. If you're going to get your bang out of your bunk, buck for benchmarking, then you really need it to inform performance improvement. And this is step one of a best practice, using that data to help create your strategic imperatives, form your performance improvement agenda, and start the process for being a data-driven organization as far as prioritizing your work throughout the year and beyond. So I see benchmarking as an essential piece of that puzzle into performance improvement. It, as I said, it's most effective when it's part of a performance management system. And I see it as the foundation for that continuous or frequent measurement of targets. I also think it's important to include that the fact that benchmarking can be the basis for identifying and celebrating performance improvement success. Sometimes we are so focused on improvement and cost reduction that we forget to celebrate success, and that is critical for the culture and climate in an organization. Benchmarking can help define that success. You can create case studies and internal stories. You can recognize people who led it. And that has a domino effect of improving the culture and getting people to embrace benchmarking and performance improvement. So Lisa, let's go to our first polling question, if you would. All right, so I will launch our first polling question, which is, what percent of hospitals, US hospitals, excuse me, do benchmarking? 20%, 50%, 75, or 100? And again, as a reminder for those of you that need CPE certificates, you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions today. So I'll give everyone another 30 seconds or so. Looks like we have most everyone that's voted. All right, so Linda, I will now share those results with you. All right. Well, it looks like there's some diversity in our responses. Uh, not unexpected at all, but the actual answer is 100%. Uh, 
Um, and the reason is that if you know your HCAPs, you've got somebody in your organization that is monitoring patient satisfaction. Through HCAPs, you are able to compare your patient satisfaction with other organizations, and that's benchmarking. Many people benchmark through AHRQ and other quality indicators. But it was a confusing question because um, what we're going to talk about today is operational benchmarking. And not everybody is doing this. This is where you're going to start benchmarking your cost position and your cost opportunities. And to me, the most important part of that function is to make sure you are triangulating the cost data with clinical data. You are, in fact, working in clinical operations. And many of you know that sometimes it's hard to get your clinicians on board with cost reduction. And actually having a tool and a culture that combines the cost view and the clinical quality view is imperative to um, taking that next step. So for some reason, I cannot advance my slide now. Um, hmm. Lisa, do you have to do something so I can advance my slide? I closed the polling question, so we should be able to move forward. I can't. So should we suggest that everybody just look on um, the documents you sent? To keep moving forward, what's your recommendation? Yes, let me see if I can. Oh, oh there you I, go. Something just happened. There we go. All right. So now getting back to benchmarking. When you do benchmarking, especially in the operational areas, you should be able to answer some key strategic questions. So the first is, how am I doing? So benchmarking should be the window into your performance. You're looking at your performance and comparing it to peers. They might be national peers. They might be regional peers. There should be the ability to benchmark yourself against yourself. And if you are in a system, you want to also benchmark within your system. Um, that's a, always a little bit of a tricky thing. So say you're in a system that has 10 hospitals of varying size. It is totally unfair to benchmark your smallest hospital against your largest hospital. So you have to make sure that if you are doing that internal benchmarking, you are compare, comparing your hospitals to an appropriate peer group that matches them in size and um, complexity. So next, once you figure out what the benchmarking says, where you are, how are you doing compared to the industry, compared to a precise group of peers, you want to understand what's next. What's the opportunity that you can find to make improvements. And here, when we get to this section, I kind of visualize a spider, you know, with numerous legs, way more than eight legs, pictured about 150 legs. And in the middle of the body, that's your overall opportunity. But each leg should take you in a direction of drill down to understand where the cost opportunities are. Is it at the system level? Is it at the hospital level? Is it at a department level? Is it at a functional level? Is it um, something that's purely overhead, or is it in the clinical care area? Is it the cost of doing um, clinical care that might have complications that are preventable? And actually, one area that people really forget about is ambulatory practices or your physician division. So if you are in an integrated delivery network that has a large employed physician division, this tends to be the largest growing expense in systems today. And there are opportunities to benchmark the care models that are in each of those clinical practices. And if you're not doing that and you have that division, you have an opportunity to really move that needle. So again, you start with kind of that diagnostic. How am I doing in the industry? And then you go deeper, where is my opportunity? And this is the part of the process where you start to form targets and priorities 
in creating teams around seizing opportunities. And then the last part of this is, am I making progress? Are you measuring every day, every week, every month to see if you are progressing? Now, I do want to create a distinction between benchmarking and routine management tools. Benchmarking isn't a source of data that you're going to necessarily look at every day, every week, or every month. Benchmarking is that view that tells you where you want to deep dive and where you want to focus. Then you use your other tools within your organization, whether it's your productivity tools, your um, performance to budget, your month-to-month uh, -month variance to budget, those types of things are the, the tools that you will use to track on a more micro level. Benchmarking will track on a more macro level. So in that section, am I making progress? You can look at trended analysis. You can periodically look at major initiatives. And this is where you can also start to evaluate and reevaluate your performance and adjust your priorities, what I call course correction during the uh, course of your performance improvement. Now I mentioned that benchmarking isn't done every week, every month. Typically, benchmarking is done twice a year. And for some of us who work in finance, it just doesn't seem like it's frequent enough. And the reason we recommend twice a year is because you want to have your people spending more time acting on the data than reviewing the data. So again, the benchmarking data will give you that diagnostic of what area is prime for focus, and then you create your initiatives to attack that cost opportunity. And that's the heavy lifting in the organization. That's where you really need to put teams together and more micrometrics to monitor process and outcome so that when you benchmark again in six months, you can demonstrate that you have moved the needle. So Lisa, why don't we try polling question number two. All right. So our second polling question is, what are the essential elements of a successful benchmarking program? Picking the right tool, getting leadership commitment, implementing ongoing measurements, effective communication about goals, or all of the above? Again, this is our second of three. So for those of you who would like to obtain a CPE certificate for today, you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. All right, Linda, so I'm going to close that question and share the results with you. OK, we have to admit, that was a pretty easy question. So definitely all of the above. So my company actually sells benchmarking tools. And there are many tools out there. Um, and I can promise you that a tool will not drive success 100%. There are many elements that you have to attend to to make performance improvement, performance management, and benchmarking successful. You've probably heard the phrase, culture eats strategy for lunch. If you have a strategy of performance improvement, but you don't have a culture that is data-driven, that is constantly driving to get data and make uh, performance improvement, then you will have a gap. And generally, getting to the right culture is a journey not necessarily a destination. You'll always be working on that. So even if you have everything in place to have a very strong performance improvement effort and you're using benchmarking to feed your systems, you will still have common challenges. Everybody does. So I'd like to walk through some of these common challenges that we see with our clients and just speak to 
ways that you can overcome some of those challenges. So first of all, it's data quality. It's getting the data right. And this is very difficult to do. Your tool has a, a big piece of that, uh, but also um, how you validate the data and how you collaborate with the people who are managing the tool is critical. So if you're going to spend your time arguing about data instead of really understanding and working towards improving your operations, then you're missing an opportunity. So getting the data right is job number one. And we get the data right through rigorously mapping and validating that data. And not only that, but you have to have transparency into the data. If your data in your tool is in a black box and people don't understand it, you will have mistrust right off the bat. And if you have mistrust, if you have data deniers, you're not going to go through the process of really moving the needle. I'll give you one quick example. Um, for those of you who are working in finance, but you understand how different nursing units work, I have a tale of two different nursing units. One nursing unit um, has their patient care assistants doing the morning phlebotomy draws. And another nursing unit has the lab come up and do the morning phlebotomy draws. The first unit will have a higher number of hours per patient day because the hours in the um, unit going towards caring for the patients are including that phlebotomy work. So if you try and benchmark those two nursing units against each other, the director and manager for the first one will say, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Our model is different. You can't hold me to the same standard. And from that point on, they will reject the data. They won't trust the data. And they'll have a leg to stand on to say they're uniquely different. But if you have mapping that takes those hours that are devoted to a phlebotomy function and move it to the lab, you mitigate that argument. If you have transparency so that that nursing director can see that those hours are moved to the lab, you will have trust and that nursing director will get on board with understanding that those things that make that department uniquely different have been moved, have been mapped, he or she can see it, and they can move on. So that's the data quality. The next piece is having the confidence in the data process. So this kind of blends with what I just mentioned. In our world, what we try and do is not have data validation live solely with finance or decision support. Because when you validate the data and you engage the department directors in that process, you actually are attending to an objective that is critical for performance improvement. You are engaging people in understanding their own operations, understanding not only their data, but how they compare. They're part of the process. And once they're part of the process, they will have the confidence in the data, they will um, appreciate the transparency, and again, they will move past the data denial state and start to engage in real performance improvement. So if you're currently using a tool and your data validation lives with finance, I would argue that you are missing a big opportunity. Next is guided impact. And the way I look at guided impact is that you might have, through an existing tool, a lot of data for benchmarking. But how do you prioritize which areas you're going to go after and what you're going to do? Because now you have data. You um, know that your costs might be high, might be low, might be within benchmark. So let's just say you have cost opportunities and you want to make improvement. Where do you go next? And so if your tool doesn't come with what I call the guided impact to say, if you only have a certain number of um, hours in the day to spend on performance improvement, which are the top opportunities that are going to have the best ROI on my investment? which are going to have the shortest turnaround time for achieving my goals, and how do I link up with the best 
performers in the industry and understand what they're doing differently than what I'm doing. And how do I build that part of the process into performance improvement? I've got the data. I'm now engaged. Now I want to identify the priorities, where I'm going to spend my time, and what should I do? How do I link with people who are actually those who have strong practices? And I can learn from them. So these challenges are really affecting anybody who's doing benchmarking and performance improvement. You can mitigate them, but I can promise you they never, ever really go away. So for those organizations that are just getting started in benchmarking, um, these are the essential steps that I think you really need to follow through on. I said three. There's actually four. I added a, um, I added a new number three kind of late in the game. But let's start with um, the right tool. Again, I mentioned that there are a lot of tools out there. But if I were just starting, I would make sure that the tool that I purchase is um, providing accurate data. It prioritizes the impact. It's easy to use because I don't want this tool to just live in decision support or finance. I want this tool to be interactive and I want it to be used by many people in the organization. And the more people who are getting into that tool and understanding their own departments, the better chance you have of really moving the performance needle. And it engages folks. And again, as I mentioned before, you get that trust and engagement with the people who are really going to make a difference. So you can have targets come from the top. It's not a bad thing. But the people who make a difference and move the performance improvement forward are the people who are closer to the operations. Next, I recommend that you establish the right structure. You um, have an executive sponsor. You have defined priorities. And you start to build that data-driven culture. So what I have seen in um, my practice, certainly, is that an executive sponsor tends to have a chief in front of their names. It might be the CEO, the COO, or the CFO. Um, but generally, it's somebody who is at the top of the organization who is sponsoring this. And it's not going to go away. We've all lived through initiatives in our organization where it's a flavor of the month. And you don't want to do this. So by setting up the right internal infrastructure, you can assure that this is going to be an ongoing initiative that becomes baked into the organization. It's continuous. And it's built upon every month, every quarter, every year. Um, third is what I added kind of late in the game, and that's provide resources. And this is what I see as kind of a continuum. There are going to be organizations out there who have very robust, centralized performance improvement departments that deploy their resources to help people with their initiatives. There are going to be other organizations that have performance improvement built into their existing management structure at the department level, and that they know what to do and how to do it, and they need less resources. And there's going to be everything kind of in between. And so to me, providing the resources is a very facility and department-specific initiative. And it requires that you really know what people need in order to help. Whenever you engage in performance improvement, it's so easy to put things on the back burner because everybody who's doing that work has a day job. And you likely are not asking them to put to the side all of the work that they're doing anyway. So you have to really understand what you're asking of people, how complex the work is going to be, and if they need resources. And sometimes that resource allocation can also help you drive what pr priorities you're going to attack. Um, sometimes they are big transformational initiatives, and sometimes they're very departmental focused. What I have found is that those organizations who have not really embraced cost management for a long period of time probably have more departmental opportunities. But if you have been managing your costs, benchmarking, and have been on a road of performance improvement 
for years. Now you are at the point of the continuum where it's going to be the big work. It's transforming your operations. It's delivering care in a different way. Still using the data uh, that you have available through your benchmarking to diagnose what that opportunity is and using the best performing peers to compare against and see what they're doing. But transforming your organizational care models is kind of that next step if you've already gotten all the low-hanging fruit. Chances are um, most organizations have some of all of that. And then lastly, you've got measurement and communication. Benchmarking is your data measuring um, tool every six months, every 12 months that's going to show you that high level of how you're doing against yourself, your past performance, and the industry. It's going to help identify if you are keeping pace with other hospitals in the industry. Uh, but you're also going to have other measures. You're going to have process and outcome measures that will roll up to support what you're trying to do. So for example, if you have, um, say, a, a problem with surgical supplies, and you have a line item on your budget, your surgical supply spend every month and you're going to have specific initiatives around that. Maybe it's reduction in inventory, maybe it's a price concession, and maybe it's utilization. All three of those levers improve your surgical supply costs. But, and you can evaluate the utilization um, every month. You can evaluate the pricing in concert with when you renegotiate. So there are different metrics that you will select that will roll up to your overall strategic imperative or your initiative, and that, that is beyond benchmarking. And then um, last, with the measurement and communication, uh, it is so critical to make sure that you are communicating these metrics of performance to the right group at the right time. This has a couple of um, positive impacts, first of all, it's going to, this kind of activity, whether it's a monthly update or whatever, is going to show that this is not a flavor of the month. This is a commitment that leadership has made. And as you know, what matters is measured. So if you are sharing metrics to your constituents, it's not long before outliers start showing up and people get reengaged because, again, what is measured matters. And especially if this is done in a transparent way, it helps get everybody on board. So then there are some of those folks out there who are not doing benchmarking, at least, uh, or I'm sorry, are doing benchmarking and have been doing it for a long time and are starting to question the value. And so I have six key questions here that I would encourage you to ask um, just to kind of enlighten your internal organization as to is benchmarking doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the first is do you feel like the data is accurate? Is it accurately mapped? Is it validated? And can you confidently defend the results? If you still have people that are denying the data, then this is a problem. And it's step one to moving forward. And if you can't get over that, you're just not going to be effective. So data accuracy is critical. The next question is about your comparison. And are you getting an apples to apples comparison with the appropriate peers? So not only do I go back and look at, you know, what hospital am I being compared to and what group and how similar are they to me, but I also want to know that at a department level. So say I'm a hospital that I have a level one trauma department and I have a level three and ICU. I only want to be compared for those two departments to those organizations that have those programs. So not only do I want to make sure that I am getting an apples to apples comparison with a facility, but I want to make sure that at the functional or department level, I feel good about the comparisons. I can learn from these other organizations and I can um, have some really t good, strong takeaway messages about what that comparison shows. The next question is, can you easily and consistently navigate 
between your clinical and operational data in one tool. And this is also, to me, very important because if you are on the end of the continuum that you're still trying to address low-hanging fruit, this might be less important. But if you have gotten rid of the low-hanging fruit and it's time to start doing the really hard stuff, you need to be able to look at clinical and operational at the same time. So I'll give you an example. Say you are a hospital that in your top 10 opportunities, you find that your surgical supplies are significantly higher than your peer group, your cost is. Um, and that's a good starting point. Now we want to improve surgical supplies. You want to be able to drill down to understand what is the lever that you want to flip to start making the improvement. Because maybe your supply chain folks have already identified the best pricing for surgical supplies. And maybe they have already reduced the number of vendors for your supplies. So then what's the next level or lever that you should start to pursue? And that's utilization. So if surgical supplies are an opportunity, you want to be able to then flip to clinical data and say, which surgical cases are standing out for the most variance in surgical supply costs? Because where there's variance, there's opportunity. And once you identify those surgical DRGs, or maybe at the service line level, then you can drill further down. And you say, OK, out of those surgical DRGs, which physicians have variation in their practice? And then also drill down and say, is it a utilization issue? Does the utilization correspond to better outcomes? Or is it the same, and it's just an opportunity to reduce the utilization? And so flipping back and forth between understanding the um, operational opportunity and the clinical opportunity is pretty critical for a more sophisticated organization. Fourth, do you spend more time arguing about the data than acting on it? And that kind of, again, goes back to, is it accurately mapped? Is it accurately validated? Are you engaging people in the validation process so that they understand it and they can defend it and they're confident? Uh, same thing with the fourth, the second to the last bullet. How often are you hearing this data isn't right and I don't trust it? And then last, do you have immediate access to a community of peers with strong practices? And I say strong practices. Um, purposely. Um, a lot of people are talking about best practices, but in operations there are rarely a short list of best practices, but there are strong practices. And so you want to understand what your like peers are doing, what kind of strong practices they have, and see what you can do to learn from them, apply them to your own, your own organization to move the needle of performance. So again, if you're doing it right, biannual benchmarking data will feed into your organizational imperatives. And then that, will, that information will cascade into your goals and your targets and into your teams and your middle management to turn operations around and to start pursue, pursuing different opportunities. So now, Lisa, we go to our last polling question. So our final polling question is, which means of generating cost reductions is likely to be more successful and drive sustained reductions? Across the board percent reductions or variable approach identifying improvement area based on data? And just a final reminder, if you are obtaining CPE certificates today, you must be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the duration, and you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. And Linda, it looks like everyone has voted, so I'm going to close that question and share the results with you. All right. We looks like we have a person or two who um, feel like across-the-board percent reductions might work. I can tell you that's not been my experience. Um, I think we've all experienced probably some of that across the board reduction, but it, it really does not leverage your true opportunities. So 
when you do an across-the-board reduction. You might even vary it so that you know patient care areas might get X percent, whereas infrastructure or overhead gets Y percent. Um, but that doesn't seize the opportunity that exists out there. When you use benchmarking, you enable a customized target based on your variance to strong practices and high-performing peers. Give you another example. Quite often when you go through um, a cost reduction effort, um, the majority of the work we do in hospitals is taking care of patients. But when you benchmark, you might find that the patient care areas are really at benchmark and that you, you need to look at other um, unusual suspects for opportunities to improve. I will tell you that it's been my experience that nursing units rarely fall out of benchmarking um, at the same rate as other areas like engineering and IT and um, biomed. There are, those are the areas that just haven't been scrutinized as systems get larger and more complex. But think about nursing. Nursing has had hours per patient day, productivity standards, tools that help them adjust their staffing in four to eight hour increments. They've had these kinds of things for two to three decades. So the amount of opportunity in nursing areas has really declined. And it, it compels us to start to look at other opportunities. Again, not the usual suspects. So I'd like to um, walk you through one organization story. And um, I, I won't name this um, organization right now, but it is a, a multi-hospital system in the Midwest. They are characterized by one large flagship system, which is a teaching hospital. They have another hospital that is fairly large. I think they're about 250 beds. And then another hospital, about 150 beds. And then maybe another six to eight hospitals that are all 100 beds or less. So they have clearly a diverse portfolio, and they cover two states. They had a long history of profitability and growth. They were the market leader. Um, they had great rates with their payers. Um, they were entrepreneurial. They were doing much more than the basic provision of healthcare in, in the hospital. And then all of a sudden in 2012, they had a significant change. And, and it wasn't in just one area. They had a change in their payer mix. They had a change in their case mix. And they had a reduction in their volume. And the flagship hospital had really been carrying the system. Um, and in the other hospitals, there was some uh, diversity of performance. Some were high performing, some were um, not. Um, but the portfolio of all the hospitals together showed a significant reduction in margin. And for the first time in their history, they lost money. So there was recognition that they needed to make a significant change. And not only because they were losing money, but that their view was that this change was a window into the future and that they needed to make a change so that they could be successful in the future. And so the CEO and the board committed to taking a new direction. And I bold that um, commit to taking a new direction because, as I mentioned before, this kind of a culture needs to start at the top. So what this particular organization did is they, they brought in some consultants to just get them started. But their overall plan was that they needed the consultants to get them started, but they wanted to be self-sustaining. And they wanted to have the tools and the technology and the people so that they could have continuous performance improvement, have a data-driven culture, and get back to a leadership position that had them profitable, had their profits feeding their growth strategies, and they would be positioned to be successful regardless of the external environment. So they happened to leverage the tool that um, our company has to identify the opportunities and then inform and prioritize those opportunities. They launched an overall organizational plan which they branded, they had an acronym for, they had training around, and they had a very robust communication plan about this new action that they were going to take housewide. And no one was um, 
left out. This included the physician enterprise, it included their nursing homes, it included all of their hospitals, and it included um, rationalizing even their administrative ranks. Their plan was to operationalize and transform their cost structures and drive meaningful savings. They also incorporated the clinical data into their priorities because they did not want to have the message that they're all about cost reduction. They wanted to have the message that they're looking at quality and patient satisfaction, physician satisfaction, safety, employee retention, and outcomes. So it was very comprehensive. And they used the numerous, um, numerous tools to do the ongoing evaluation. So today, this organization has a very data-driven culture. And it's so data-driven that the management teams actually welcome the data. When it's time to get their new benchmarking refresh, they can't wait to get it because they want to see how they're doing. Are they leaders in the organization? And if they're not, what's the next priority they're going to seize? So what I have in front of you now are some of their results. Over the four-year period, they reduced their cost by $150 million. And this organization, I believe, is a $1.6 billion net patient revenue system. And the six examples that I have are six of their hospitals. We just drew some of the things that were happening at the different hospital levels. So the $150 million cost reduction is for the system. You'll see one of their hospitals reduced their nursing cost per day by 41%. Reduced dietary service costs per case by down 84%. Uh, another hospital, respiratory therapy, had their cost per procedure reduced. Med surge supplies reduced. Another hospital uh, focused on rehab services and dropped their cost opportunity. Also cost, dropped their uh, surgical supplies at a cost per case level. Um, you'll see that an, another hospital had to focus on environmental services. That's evaluated by the cost per square foot to clean. And they were able to reduce that significantly. Also reduced laundry and linen costs. Another hospital reduced their ER costs per visit and ultrasound costs per visit. And, I, and I, I'll tell you also that this is not a one-size-fits-all. One of, one of the opportunities that might have been done in one hospital is shared with other hospitals, but because there's such a diversity in size and complexity, you can't necessarily mirror what everybody's doing. You can share your strong practices, and then you adapt. So this organization, in tracking all of these opportunities that were achieved, also created the dialogue for sharing these strong practices across the system. And this is what they use to celebrate success. And they not only celebrated the success of the numbers, but who led the initiative, who was involved. And that kind of internal recognition um, just started to, again, be a domino effect of a positive data-driven culture. So I'm going to conclude here with just making a differentiating differentiation between um, working without benchmarking and with it. So if you are not using benchmarking, you're probably budgeting in a way that you're doing year-over-year -year improvement targets. I'm going to reduce you know, by X percent or X dollars, or I'm going to cut consulting costs. I mean, there's just um, some fairly uh, precise things that you might do. But it still ignores the opportunity of what you could do. Targets applied across as a constant. Um, aren't customized and, again, don't seize the opportunity of where you have poor performing departments and functions compared to the industry versus when you have really high performing ones. Um, and also without benchmarking, often organizations focus on the usual suspects like nursing and they miss real opportunities. And you don't necessarily have that opportunity to celebrate performance. With benchmarking, all those things are different. You can have a very customized budgeting and target approach based on variance to the industry, variance to strong practice. That customized target 
can be created at a department level, a functional level, or even a case level. And you can get your physicians involved. Once you're talking about service lines and cases, your physicians and clinic clinicians can get on board and help to reduce variation and improve care. And then again, with benchmarking, you can see if you are improving at a pace rapid enough to just simply keep up with the industry. I mentioned earlier that iVantage um, has a benchmarking tool. The benchmarking tool that we offer not only um, is characterized by having that unmatched accuracy, uh, but it is a tool that also engages people because of the user experience, how easy it is to cascade it into your department levels, and, um, and it prioritizes all of your data into those opportunities that will give you the best bang for your buck. Um, I also have here that it is cloud-based. I always like to mention that because no IT resources are required to launch this. And in a time when IT is running fast and furiously with trying to optimize their EHRs and coordinate all the different uh, systems, uh, that's pretty important. And then finally, um, we do believe that one of the hallmarks of really moving from your benchmarking to true performance improvement is that your users are trusting the data, they're involved in the validation process, and they're using the tool, and they're fully engaged and that's what will move the needle for performance. So that is it for my formal remarks, and I think, Lisa, we go back to you to see if there have been any questions that have arisen during the conversation. Yes, yeah, so for the audience, if you have questions, you can enter those in the chat box. They will come directly to me, and I can read them out loud so that everyone on the call is able to hear what others would like to know. We'll give everyone a few minutes to get some of this submitted. So Linda, first question for you. How long does it take to implement a benchmarking program? You know, I believe that different tools have different requirements. Our tool is about eight weeks. And that from the, um, us receiving the data until all of the first level reports are done and all of the data has been fully validated. Uh, and again, some other organizations it might be uh, a little longer, but eight weeks is a real good gauge. I have another one for you, Linda. How are peers selected? How do you know who you are compared to? Well, first of all, peers are selected based on several parameters. Um, I'm speaking about our tool. I can't necessarily say that this is how the peers are selected in all of the tools. We try and limit the peer group to 20 to 25. We believe that too large of a peer group actually creates a lot of noise. So we try and get a very precise peer group that is similar to each of your hospitals based on the number of discharges, surgical case mix index, your ratio of inpatient to outpatient revenue, and then finally, um, specific programs. Like I mentioned earlier, if you have a level one trauma, you really only want to have your whole surgical division and your ER compared to other organizations that have level one trauma. If you have a level three nursery, you only want to have those kinds of OB divisions that have a level three nursery. Those are the two programs that tend to stand out. The third one, which happens a little uh, less often, but is more prevalent in the AMC um, space, is transplant. The other thing I should mention with um, the peers and um, and, and this, if you're looking for a tool, I would suggest that you really look at this feature. You want transparency. You want to know exactly who you're compared to. You don't want a black box. A black box of data or a black box of your peer group by name will in, contribute to that data denial, that data mistrust. So 
anything you can do to have transparency in your tool and your data will help you move forward on improving the outcomes of performance improvement. Great, thank you. So we have a few more minutes if anyone else has questions that they would like to submit. Again, you can do that in the chat box of your GoToWebinar screen. Linda, I have another one for you. When you do benchmarking, which areas do you find have the most opportunity for cost reduction? That's a great question. Um, I mentioned earlier that nursing tends to not be uh, one of those areas. Now, different departments of nursing may show up, but rarely uh, is nursing the dominant opportunity. Most often, I'm seeing surgical supplies, surgical services, which would include DOR, peri-op, and post-op, um, pharmaceutical supplies, and engineering, sometimes benefits, and quite often administration, which would be your administrative overhead. And that tends to be more prevalent in multi-hospital systems that are forming into an integrated delivery network. Great. So at this time, I don't see any other questions that have come through. If you have any closing comments, that would be great. We certainly appreciate having you on today. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we're happy to uh, share case studies and experiences, especially if there are things that others can learn from and take and drive improvements in their own organizations. So um, my contact information is on the slide. If anybody wants more detail or, again, just copies of some case studies, to just stimulate their thinking as to how they can move the needle in their own organizations. We are happy to help. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. We really appreciate having you on. You bet. Thank you.